So hello everybody, thank you so much for joining us on our very last stop for our National Fossil Day livestream, Let's Tour. Um, we, as Laura said, at the world famous La Brea Tar Pits. So for today's episodes, what we've been doing is asking the question, why are museum collections important? For most of us, we only think of the exhibits on display, but really those are just a very small part of what makes a museum a museum. To really appreciate a museum and to answer the question, we have to go behind the scenes and see where museums keep all their collections and, in this case, prepare their specimens. So we are going to be getting a special look at the La Brea Tar Pits with our guest paleontologist today. Just as a reminder, because we are in a global pandemic, both of our guest paleontologists here at the La Brea Tar Pits have taken all the precautions necessary to ensure and prevent the spread of the disease. So let's get started. Let's welcome you both, and thank you so much for being here. thought that we could use that as our specific topic for today and uh, we always love celebrating National Fossil Day because it is put on by the National Park Service and we here at Rancho La Brea are actually a national natural landmark with the National Park Service. Back when that program was originally started in 1964 was about the first uh, round batch of places to get that designation and we like to celebrate it whenever we can. Um, many of the things that we're working on around the site are several different excavation sites that have been worked on off and off for over a hundred years. Where we are right now is the current excavation site, Project 20, so named because when the art museum that's sharing the park with us in 2006 was digging an underground parking garage, they came across many, many deposits of fossils within that parking garage. So because we're in California when we are. There were a lot of specialists on site working to help protect those fossils and what they were able to do to get so many of them out of the way is what they isolated, built boxes around them with the same company that helps move live trees by building boxes around the tree balls and they brought them over in a series of boxes, 23 of them in total, as you may have been able to guess, which is why we call it Project 23. And we've been working in these boxes off and on since 2008. And right now I am sitting with the very last bit of box 14 and Myrene is sitting in. And Myrene, did you want to talk about some of your things first? Um, yes, yeah, so um, he had 23. So this is an ongoing. And we have you know, obviously a huge cluster um, of specimens here that have yet to be excavated, but we also have here a couple of specimens from other bodies taken out and um, cleaned. And so, for example, um, and I really want to highlight here um, size differences among our specimens. So, uh, here we have, and I'm not sure if you can even see this. Um, let me just ease out here but this is a weasel jaw and so this weasel jaw is from box nine and um what press on you is that this weasel so this is the lower jaw of a weasel and this specific species the long-tailed weasel is still here in california today and so um for um, our large, our large animals, or megafauna, um, and here is one of those, uh, a specimen of one of those larger mammals. This is from a dire wolf. Uh, this is part of a vertebra from a dire wolf. Um, so this is, um, we are kind of known for our dire wolves and saber tooth cats, our large mammals, um, but as I highlighted the, um, the weasel first because I think it's pretty interesting that 
uh, Ranch La Brea preserves not only really charismatic megafauna, like you see in the movie Ice Age or even in Thrones, but also the smaller um, animals that have survived the Ice Age extinctions and continue to live with us today. So the small weasel is only one of those. Um, and um, Project 23 especially has just for yielding not these small uh, specimens, not these smaller specimens were preserved more often in Project but because Project 23, um, now that we have these um, modern excavation techniques that really take into account you know, collecting metadata um, and collecting also, um, really collecting everything, not just big specimens. Um, so now that we have, uh, you know, a more holistic, if you will, uh, perspective, to the site with this um, newish excavation, um, you know, now we make sure to collect not just not just the bigger specimens, but also the smaller ones that you know I have to bring up to the camera to zoom in. Um, yeah, how about you, Laura? What specimens do you have? Well, since you brought out a dire wolf, which is our most common large animal that we have here. Because, because we're spoiled, spoiled rotten. rotten. Um, um, I, I brought, brought our, one of our second most common large animal that we have here. So this is actually a saber-toothed cat. This is actually a saber-toothed kitten specifically. And uh, I'm going to figure out where my camera is. There we are. And so this one is a femur, which is a thigh bone. And the way that I can tell that it's from a kitten and not from a smaller animal is that the growth plates on the ends, those epiphyses is what they're called, haven't finished attaching on this individual yet. So... This was a saber-toothed kitten about the size of a pit bull. I like to imagine that I could still carry it, but kind of awkwardly, like resting mostly on one hip. But it still had quite a bit of room to grow before it was the adult that I would definitely just run and hide from. And uh, I also like this one because even though this particular surface of it is very clean, it still would have a lot of cleaning to be done by my coworkers inside the laboratory, inside the museum. Because again, all of that preparation work is still done on site as well. But as well, all of the fossils that are still stuck to the other side of this bone. So this is still what we call matrix, which is that combination of silts, sands, clay, gravel, asphalt, and other fossils that are still stuck to this larger bone. So even though I'm holding one bone right now, I'm probably holding about 20 fossils total. Some of the other things I can see, there's a little uh, bird toe over on this side, I promise, and an insect head over on this side. But it's one of those things that we do our best to recover every fossil that we have, not just the larger fossils. Because the grand scheme of things, like Myrene was mentioning, it's not just the larger fossils that belong to animals that may have traveled hundreds of miles during their lifetime and just so happen to die here. There's a lot to be learned from those smaller animals and plants that belong to species that are still around and that tend to be much pickier about where they live since they aren't traveling as long as distances. So when we're trying to understand what it's like in a particular place at a particular time, these smaller fossils are helping us to tell larger stories. And speaking of small fossils, I did also bring, because one of our new curators, Dr. Reagan Dunn, is specializing in plants. And that's been some of the first larger scale uh, plant research that we've been planning lately. And so she would probably be mad at me if I didn't bring some plant fossils. So I'm going to step out of frame for a second and just bring my hand in. My hand is covered in juniper seed pods. So all of these separate individual things are just juniper seeds from just a particular area found around where that saber-toothed kitten was from in this block that had been behind me here. So again, even though these seeds uh, cannot be grown anymore, the parts that still keep them alive are gone we still have a very good record of exactly what types of plants were living in this particular area. And since we don't have these particular trees necessarily living here naturally, and that helps un understand a lot of what has changed between then and now. And uh, this block behind me here is only a couple hundred pounds right now. This is mostly uh, sands and silts and clays and asphalt and fossils. But all these separate individual bumps that you can kind of see are still separate individual fossils. There are still probably a couple thousand fossils left in just this bit. This is the very end of box 14, which was ex 
extensively fossiliferous or fossil rich. And uh, the original block was about 86,000 pounds. So you can imagine the tens of thousands of fossils that we've been recovering from that, not just of those large animals, but the small animals as well. And all of these are, again, part of that reason why we have our national natural landmark status, because again, we're not just focusing on a couple of individual animals. We're looking at a window into the entire Los Angeles basin of tens of thousands of years ago and helping attract some of that through time. So again, we're terribly spoiled. <laughs> Irene, if you wanted to go ahead again. Uh, yes, yeah, we're terribly spoiled. So definitely we are, um, we are, so Project 23 focuses on about, um, about 30,000 to 50,000, possibly older um, years ago. But Rancho La Brea, uh, this site generally preserves fossils from about 50,000 uh, years ago to um, the end of the last ice age, which was about 11,000 years ago and slightly after that. Um, in fact, Rancho La Brea, um, if you walk through the park where we're at right now, um, we still have active asphalt seeps um, uh, acting up every so often. Um, so you can actually say that we, um, that the asphalt seeps are continuing to trap animals, um, possibly food and, and plants, possibly fossil to this day. So uh, I am sitting in box 13 and um, Laura, please correct me if I'm wrong, but you can see that box 13, um, you know, the back border of uh, the border behind me is up here. Um, the All of these fossils used to come up to here, if not higher. Is that correct? A Laura? little bit higher, actually. We've cut uh, it down a little bit as we go. That's mm -hmm. all right. We made it look so pretty that I'm glad to know that you couldn't tell that we'd cut it down already. <laughs> oh, yes. Oh, yeah. I, I couldn't. But <laughs> but if you use me for scale, uh, you can imagine just how large this deposit used to be. And um, so here we have a jumble of ribs uh, from large herbivores, most likely, like horse and bison. So the species of horse that we used to have here is different from um, the species of horse that we have here now. And the same goes for the species of bison. And um, we also have, uh, so Ranch La Brea, we are our so actually have a lot of birds, um, possibly even uh, more species of, or definitely more species of bird actually than mammal. It's just that uh, more attention has uh, focused on the mammals. But um, yes, yeah, so uh, there are definitely some bird fossils here as well um, that have yet to be uh, taken out. But here is one, for example. And um, let's see, yeah, let us check on our time. Um, well, we have a couple more minutes if you'd like to chat more about uh, box 14, Laura. Absolutely. So again, it's one of those things where with Project 23, uh, we didn't necessarily just start at box one and continue on through because each of those boxes, the number that was associated with them wasn't necessarily their order of importance in any particular way. It was really just the order in which those deposits were found. So as the project has gone on, there's been a constant reassessment over and over, depending on whatever our current research goals are as to which particular deposits we're working on at a particular time. And that is why we have to kind of constantly reassess, like, you know, we aren't just digging up fossils just to dig fossils. This is uh, contributing to research. So again, uh, Box 14 got uh, bumped up the priority list a while back to go with one of our food webs grants that many of our colleagues were working on, which were looking again at a lot of those smaller animals and plants and trying to understand more ecologically what this site was looking like in a broader sense. And then as new projects keep coming up, our, our assessment of exactly where the highest priority is also is very nimble. And uh, which is also why when people ask me, how long does it take to finish a box? I have no, so in case that was your question, I'm gonna interrupt you right now and say that the largest of our deposits, box one, was over 123,000 pounds. Our smallest box, 10B, was only about 10,000 pounds. And the number of fossils in them, again, there are some deposits like box 14 that have easily, I'm very comfortable saying, tens of thousands of fossils in them. And honestly, once they finish counting every single lizard scale, mouse toe, insect legs, seed pod, freshwater snail, if eventually collections manages to count all of those, thank you for all the work that they do, 
uh, and they tell me that it was over 100,000 fossils, I wouldn't be surprised. It's exceptionally dense, even for how spoiled we are. But again, so a box like that is going to take a lot longer than some of the smaller boxes that only had hundreds of fossils in them. Yes, again, I'm very spoiled. Only hundreds of fossils per box. Um, but in case anyone was wondering just kind of what that order is, a lot of it's very dynamic and depends on what the current research goals of the time are. Oh, absolutely. Oh, absolutely. I'll just talk, oh, forever, I'll just talk forever otherwise. Forever, otherwise. <laughs> Lee, Lee. Well, thank you so much uh, for that. That was just some really, really cool stuff. Uh, for me, this is awesome because the La Brea Tar Pits is my home museum, I guess. And so I'm just really, really excited. I, I used to visit that place as a kid all the time. And so like being able to like see you all working there, but also because you are my friends, it's really cool just to be able to like see what's happening there. So I'm really excited that you were able to join us today. We're excited to be here. <laughs> Brit, your audio went off again. <laughs> Not quite yet. I'll, I'll ask one question and then we'll come back to yours. All right. So, Laura, Myreen, um, the question we've been asking everybody is because, you know, the La Brea Tar Pits is such a public, you know, place with, you know, the excavation site and everything, how has the pandemic affected the way that you all work right now? Uh, so it's definitely been one of those things where, as I was just gesturing, like, this is the public park, just a couple feet away from where I'm working, that I just cropped out a shot to keep people's consent going. Um, but at the same time, that's been one of our strengths uh, for so long, is that so much of this work is happening where the public can see and visit. And it definitely has been hard for us uh, with the pandemic and being closed and not having that kind of regular engagement. I definitely still have several people that I'll chat with as I'm coming to the site. Uh, and so far, people have been very understanding, saying, yes, we want to wait until everything can be safe for everybody. And I've been really appreciating that and still looking forward to when we can uh, have a little bit more visibility and share with more people. Um, but honestly, at the same time, it's also been very nice to kind of swing some of our emphasis to some of this digital engagement and be able to really reach out we're a major tourist location. We have visitors from all over the world. And that's another thing that I feel very spoiled about is that I get to chat with people from all over the world and talk about science. But at the same time, uh, just the accessibility of the digital engagement um, is something that's been a very silver lining for me. And I'm very excited about it. So uh, Marie, I don't know if you have anything else, but that's been me. I miss people, but I'm glad to see different people. <laughs> Right. Yeah. So Laura has addressed it from more the excavation standpoint, um, you know, uh, more this the outside standpoint. And um, my standpoint usually is from inside the museum. So I like mucking around here as well. But um, a lot of the work that I do is looking at um, looking at, you know, already clean specimens like these little weasel that I showed earlier. Um, and actually, um, I like that we have this weasel because it's act, it's one of my focal uh, species at the moment. And so um, I'm going to try not to I got it just for you. Uh, <laughs> here we go. So again, um, zooming into that weasel right there, weasel lower jaw. And um, so usually I work with um, these uh, specimens in the collections inside. And, but, you know, with COVID, we haven't been... Uh, permitted so much uh, to be um, inside with everyone else at the same time, and so it's been um, it's been a slower pace of work in that our actual on-site time has been limited to make room for everyone else. But it's also been, um, as Laura has referenced, it's, it's also been um, kind of a faster pace of work because we are able to. The remote format that everyone, uh, is, in. Um, format that everyone is in really enables these uh, virtual remote collaboration. Um, so, for example, in addition to uh, so um, so I was working this past summer on weasels with an undergraduate from the University of Chicago. 
um, his name is Jake Feingold, and um, we were not, we were never working in person together this summer, uh, although we had worked together in person um, in uh, last summer. But um, but Jake and I were able to, um, you know, using photographs of these old jaws like this, we were able to do. Um, a lot of our work in figuring out how weasels used to, or how weasels have changed over the last uh, 50,000 years. And also, um, to bring out this star wolf vertebra again, um, with a pen, uh, uh, um, we've been working more on papers, on publishing um, our research that we just needed to write up. And, um, this direwolf vertebra was not one of the things that we published, but um, some collaborators from uh, the Natural History Museum here, um, and also collaborators from um, Beijing, and I were able to um, remotely collaborate and publish this paper um, that integrated uh, both dire wolves here from Rancho La Brea and um, in this study of this uh, this ancient Chinese wolf. Um, in the study of, uh, they're just trying to figure out, oh, this ancient Chinese wolf from about 1.3 million years ago um, shows these injuries uh, in its skeleton that are, um, that suggest, you know, oh, maybe it was hunting a certain way or maybe it had a social behavior. A <laughs> And um, we were able to compare um, that specimen to specimens here at Rancho Brea of our very own dire wolf and say, okay, these look like similarly injured um, specimens. And if the injuries are similar, then it's likely that they were behaving, um, that they were hunting in similar ways. Awesome. <laughs> All right, can you hear me? We can hear you now. Yes, we can. <laughs> Yay! Sometimes my microphone just doesn't want to play nicely anymore. <laughs> okay, so uh, some more questions. And like I said, we're going to get to as many as we can. Um, so let's see. So there's a lot of them. So we'll see how many we get to. Uh, this is from Maureen. Uh, how is the, this is from Ruth. So I think someone who knows you. How is the work <laughs> on fossilized dog poop? Oh. <laughs> yes. yes. Hi, Ruth. Hi, Ruth. Uh, great great, great to hear from you. And thanks for uh, uh, fossilized dog poop. Uh, fossilized dog poop. So here at Rancho La Brea, we have not found fossilized wolf poop. Um, I'll talk about. I'll talk more about other poop. Um, actually, Laura would be is in, in a, is in a great position to talk about other fossilized poop here at Rancho La Brea. Um, but what Ruth is referring to is um, uh, the uh, so uh, a lot of my other work concerns dogs, um, not just here at Rancho La Brea, but also um, in all of North America. And one of um, the, one of the other, um, one of my other projects has been um, this one fossilized, um, th this one site that in the Central Valley of California that happened to preserve um, poop from about five to six million years ago. Um, and this is from a dog that used to crack book, um, poop, that used to crack book, um, called Barofagus. So uh, millions of years old, not closely related to our dog here in, um, here in LA, here in LA uh, but still a dog regardless. Uh, so maybe one day we will find similarly fossilized dog or wolf poop here at French Australia. <laughs> But until then, I think Laura has something to share with us about other fossilized poop that we have here. And I'll mention it very briefly because I know we have a lot of questions to get to, so I'm going to try to uh, tidy things up. But yes, uh, earlier on in pandemic, one of the papers that came out that I was uh, a co-author on uh, did talk about some of the uh, fossilized rodent poop from here at Rancho La Brea. The uh, copper lights from actually one of the boxes of Project 23, box one which was the first time we've ever documented copper lights, so fossil poop here from our entire site. We've been digging here for over a hundred years. We have millions of fossils. First time we've noticed these particular things, so that was very exciting. Cool. Awesome. Okay, so um, <clears throat> when were the tarpids actually first discovered? So very first discovered um, in records that we have is the early 1900s. Um, there was... Uh, 
Denton, who was one of the people who said, hey, everybody, the bones that are here are fossils. And the scientific community had some issues with him because he also would be like, and I have seances and this is what they tell me. <laughs> so again, like the credibility is a little bit of a concern, um, but it wasn't until uh, geologist, uh, oil geologist, John Orkut, then slightly later on, it was like, no, really scientific community, this is a cool paleontological site. And so it was about 1914 and 1916 that uh, our particular museum, we're under the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County, was given exclusive rights. So other expeditions had happened here, but then it was really one of those things where LA County was like, wait, a lot of these people are coming, digging up the fossils and taking them other places. This is our story. We wanted the chance to tell it here. And at the time, this was the boonies of Los Angeles, and now we're in mid-city. So the city's kind of grown up around the site. So luckily we got in early so we could protect this particular area. But the family who actually owned the ranch at the time uh, donated to the county this 23.6 acres to help protect the fossils on this site. So uh, there are many different ages, but early 1900s, late 1800s is when people first started noticing, hey, wait, this oil site that we've been collecting the oil from to use for commercial purposes also has paleontological value. What a great story. Okay. Here's a good question. Uh, <laughs> how difficult is it to clean the tar from your clothes? So I basically have work clothes and home clothes. <laughs> um, with Project 23, because we're not digging in an area where the fresh oil is still coming up, we actually sometimes have to use a chemical solvent to help loosen up the material around it so that we can get through the sand and that sort of thing. Um, but... It's more, Product 23 is more like dusty dirty rather than sticky dirty, but areas like Pit 91, we have separate clothes that we wear for that. Um, so I don't usually try to clean that. If absolutely I need be, I will use like an orange oil based cleanser, but uh, usually I try to keep those separate. <laughs> yeah, I gotta say, I've, I've started wearing more black clothing <laughs> since I here at Rancho La Brea. We stick around. Yeah. I think yeah. uh, I think we have time Wonderful. for about one more question. Okay. Let's see. So how long did Box 14 take to excavate? So Box 14 is difficult because it was one of those that was worked on for a time, then put on hold, then worked on for a time, put it put on hold. But it was originally started in summer of 2010. <laughs> I was thinking about it, and I was like, wait, yes. So again, uh, I was hopefully going to have it done by now. We had a bit of a pause with, you know, the global pandemic. Um, but uh, it's been very more off than on, but it was originally started in summer of 2010. All righty. Thank you so much, guys, for joining us today. That was great, and um, it was awesome. And thank you, everybody uh, in the chat who's still viewing. Thank you for sticking with us to the end of the day. <laughs> we made it. We made it through all of our stuff. We made it. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. So if um, if our viewers would like to learn more about you or uh, your museum or your uh, individual work, where can they go? Uh, I believe you have helpfully linked a lot of our different social media platforms and websites. So thank you for doing that down in the description box below. Um, but otherwise, tarpits.org for those who are listening in audio format, just in case. And uh, we hope to continue opening up portions of our museum. Uh, but until then, we have a lot of digital engagement that we've been doing both with us and with our parent institution, the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County. All right. Well, that does it. And there are no more stops on this train. We are done for the day. Thank you, everybody who joined us. And thank you to everyone uh, of our museum partners who uh, graciously showed off their collections and uh, gave their time and their expertise today. We really, uh, really appreciate it. Um, so again, I'm from the Western Science Center. Gabe is from the Raymond M. Alf Museum. And if you would like to support either of these museums, um, just like a lot of museums today, um, we are still closed to the public, but we're doing lots of virtual engagement, a couple of outdoor things. We are doing the best we can to still bring science to our areas and beyond. So if you'd like to support either of our museums, there'll be links to do that in the description below. And if you want to learn more about National Fossil Day, because this day comes every year. Uh, you can from National the Park Service at nps.gov. And go ahead and like and subscribe. We'll have more Fossil Friday chats next week, and you'll be able to revisit this live stream whenever you like. So thank you, everybody, and thank you guys for joining us. Happy, Happy National, National Fossil, Fossil Day, everyone. Day. Happy National thank Fossil Day. Thank you so much. <laughs>